Divine Truth Frequently Asked Question Session. Jesus, Mary and others provide answers to questions that are frequently asked by members of the media and public. This presentation is part of the Religion General series. Mary asked Jesus various basic questions about world religion. Recorded on the 6th of January 2013 in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. This is Session 1, Part 1. How would you define a religious movement? Well, I would define a religious movement as any individual or group of people that get together to define how they should worship or give allegiance to God and they define a whole group of their own belief systems and structures. In other words, they're all man-made belief systems and structures that define how they should worship God. I feel quite strongly that uh, the majority of religions on, on the planet have done this. They have, they have gotten a group of philosophies together based upon their previous experience and, and also different emotional belief systems that they've already had before then. And then they've constructed an entire set of belief structures uh, that they feel God wants them to worship uh, as. And uh, then they just go ahead and engage that particular belief structure, oftentimes for the rest of their lives, and try to enforce it upon other people mm -hmm. as well. Um, obviously, I do not feel uh, that religion on the planet at this point in time has anything to do with God's viewpoint of what should be done. I feel it's mostly a viewpoint of what man feels should be done, or groups of men and women feel should be done, rather than actually listening to God, how, how does God want to be worshipped, if God even wants to be worshipped. I feel the biggest problem that we have on earth with regard to religion is that we're not interested in how God wants to be worshipped. We're not interested in what God feels about any of these matters. We're only interested in our own philosophies about what we believe God is and what we believe God should be and what we believe God should do and what we believe God, how God should act and what we believe we should act with each other and what we believe is bad and what we believe is good. And this then forms religious practice. And I feel that's a deep error that we have in our society about religion. So just to clarify, you feel that all religious um, movements on the planet are based around man-made ideals? Yes, and pretty much all religious movements on the planet. Even the movement based upon after myself, the Christian movement, is is... Well, it has nothing or very little to do with what I actually did teach in the first century. And if you look at, if you actually compare what the Bible actually says a religious or a Christian religious practice is compared to what Christian religions are actually doing, you'll see there's quite a large discrepancy between both of those particular things. And a lot of it is based around, unfortunately, based around what mankind wants to do rather than what God believes mankind needs to do or should perhaps do, not that God believes mankind should do anything. You see, I feel a lot of the times uh, religion is all about control and manipulation. It's a way of controlling masses of people into a different, into a belief system that, that feels safe and secure or that feels uh, meets a lot of their needs. Um, but, but unfortunately is not very heavily based around truth. What we need is a way of life that is based around truth, and that's not a religion. That is going to be a way of life based around truth only, and this includes scientific truth. It includes all truth, not just selective truth, things that we, uh, books that we believe in because we believe they're God's word, for example, um, but that demonstrate themselves to be illogical um, is not a way, is not a great way of basing a, a, a formal practice that, on which we base our entire life. The media says that you're beginning a new religious movement. What do you say about that? <laughs> well, they're wrong on a number of fronts. Firstly, all myself and you do is we present seminars to people uh, of, of what we believe is truth but we don't have any religious format, we don't have any control, we don't have any services, we don't have any uh, religious practices, we don't have any formal things that we force upon a group of people. So we're not starting a new religious movement at all. In fact, there is no such thing as a new religious movement called divine truth. 
certainly none that I've started anyway. Um, I don't also feel that we're new. Um, the reality is divine truth has been around as long as God's been around. God was the creator of all truth and is the creator of all truth. Bearing that in mind, that means that divine truth has existed before I've ever come into existence and will exist if I ever pass it will be, uh, and ever go out of existence, it will still exist. So the reality actually is that divine truth is not new. However, divine truth is certainly new to the planet 2000 years ago. And uh, before then, divine truth wasn't well known on the planet. Bits of truths were well known, but not all of the divine truth. And divine truth, uh, or a large majority of it, as is now, you know, more and more available to us. So we're not starting a new religious movement because we're not new and we're also not a religious movement. <laughs> yeah, and in a previous question, you answered uh, what you feel a religious movement is. And you talked about um, uh, religious movements being based on man, man's ideas of what God wants. So are you saying, how do you respond to that in the context of divine yeah, this, truth? This, the divine truth that we're teaching is not based on my ideas. In fact, it, um, it's highly unlikely in my wildest dreams that I would have ever come up with these ideas. <laughs> what what uh, is, has actually happened is God has shared with me through a process that 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 and God shared with me the process but God has shared with me through the process of how to discover divine truth from God and how to actually receive these truths into myself into my soul and as a result of that I'm just sharing these methods with other people that's all I am doing and um, so I don't believe they are my truths I believe they are God's truths that I've had to come to terms with and sometimes with a lot of resistance, <laughs> I've had to come to terms with them. Mm -hmm. And as a result of coming to terms with these truths, um, I'm now sharing them with others. And, uh, and because I know them to be true. If I felt something was not true or I didn't know it to be true, then I, I clarify. This is what I feel, but I don't know if it's true. And unfortunately, a lot of people then think that I'm saying that that's true, but, but they haven't listened carefully to my words. I will state very clearly what I believe to be true, and I'll also state very clearly what I, is my own opinion, and I don't really know whether it's true or not. Um, and I feel what we're teaching, though, is divine truth, is the things that I'm very clear are true. And, and these particular things weren't given, weren't, are not mine. I didn't create them. God created them. They were in existence before I came into existence. And all, all I've managed to do is discover them, just like a scientist has managed to discover new scientific theories. And that's all I've managed to do is discover the divine truth and then had a willingness to share it with others. Do you feel that a person leaving your group will result in them leaving God? Well, first, the first question is, do we have a group? And the answer to that is no, we don't have one. So it's impossible for anybody to leave a group that we don't actually have. Uh, secondly, if, if they were leaving any group, um, I don't believe that they will disconnect from God necessarily. So whether a person is connected to God or not is got, has got nothing to do with what groups they're in. It's got everything to do with their personal practices that are either in harmony or out of harmony with divine love and divine truth. So my suggestion to a person is, is to understand that their relationship with God is personal, that they have a personal feeling that they can develop with God and they can receive truths from God personally. They have the ability to go through this process in the, in, in the way in which we've described and we've teach, taught the divine truth to others. And, and they don't have to worry about whether they need to be with a group or not because they, there is no group to be with. It's an individual practice that they would need to choose to engage with God if they're going to practice it. And they don't have to even choose to practice it. They can just listen and never practice it for the rest of their lives if, that, if that's what they want to do. So my feelings are that uh, if a person leaves our so-called group that we don't have, there is no dangers whatsoever uh, in, in doing such a thing. The danger, though, is in attaching themselves to any belief structure or belief system that is out of harmony with love and truth. As soon as you attach yourself to a belief system that is out of harmony with love and truth, you are automatically going to experience some pain and suffering 
through the choices that you're making. And that's where I feel the dangers actually lie, attaching yourself to belief systems that are not in harmony with love and truth. Hmm. Do you accept people who remain in their current religion? And in addition, if a person you know goes to a religion, do you excommunicate them? Well, firstly, as I pointed out before, I believe any religion on the planet is just a formulation of mankind's ideas about how they need to worship God. And as such, uh, I don't have any control over that. Neither do I have control over any individual on the planet. So therefore, I don't have any problem with any person going from religion to religion to religion and, uh, and doing whatever they wish, even not having a religion if that's what they wish not believing in God, believing in God, I have no problem with any set of belief systems in the person. The only time I have an issue with a person generally is when their attitude is one that lacks love, that lacks um, a desire to be loving with other people. I then, of course, withdraw my company from such individuals. But, but aside from that, I don't see any problem with them coming along to seminars that myself and yourself give to, to people and going along to Catholic church and going along to the Orthodox Greek church or going along to the, the mosque or going along to any other type of religious form that, that, that appeals to them in any way. I do believe that in time, as they receive more and more divine truth from God, they'll realise that the relationship with God is a very personal relationship and in the end, that they probably don't need their religious faith in order to, to, to continue and develop their relationship. However, I don't see any harm in such religions as long as the religions themselves are teaching things that are in harmony with love and truth. If the religion itself is teaching things that are out of harmony with love and truth, then there is a great deal of harm that can be garnered to the soul of the individual and perpetrated from that person to others if they engage the beliefs and practices of a religion that is out of harmony with love and truth. So the real question comes is, are the teachings in harmony with love and truth? That's really all that matters, I feel. But this question is talking about whether you would accept them or reject them or excommunicate them, uh, in whether they were in a religion that was in harmony with truth, out of harmony with truth, would that affect how you deal with them? Well, let's look at the word excommunicate. It really means to not communicate, to, okay. to not communicate any longer um, yeah. to, with a person. Now, the only time when I will not communicate any longer with a person is when they themselves have demonstrated a lack of love towards myself or towards others, and they are very insistent on that behaviour. In other words, they're doing that with, they're taking those actions with purposeful desire and intent. And, uh, and there are some people who have done that with me and therefore I can't speak with them anymore until they stop doing that. And then when they stop doing it, I'll be perfectly happy to speak with them again. Um, so my feelings are that excommunication is really only possible under one particular guideline and that is how is a person treating you or another? Are they treating you with love and respect? And if so, why would you want to get rid of them out of your life? Mm -hmm. They're a lovely person. You want those kind of people in your life. And... Um, the, I would say, certainly never attempt to get rid of a person out of my life just because they don't believe something that I believe. And that includes whether they believe that I'm Jesus or not. That doesn't bother me in the least. Um, the only time I feel that I don't want a person in my life is when they treat me badly. Then I certainly wouldn't want them in my personal life. But in terms of excommunicating from a group, well, there is no group to excommunicate from. They would only be excommunicated from my life if they treated me badly, if that makes sense. And there is no excommunication or formal excommunication that I would teach anybody to engage in under any circumstances. There is no need to prevent somebody else from accessing your life unless the person who's attempting to access your life is attempting to harm you in some way. And then, of course, you would step away from the interaction. And when you say you'd step away from them, is that a permanent situation? No, you? they can change their mind some point in the future. They could change their actions some point in the future. They could become sorry for what they've done in the past. And then I'd be perfectly happy to accept them back because I know then that I'm not going to get treated badly more often in the future. So, yeah, there is no need for a permanent excommunication from a person's life. And... Um, Although the question is really about excommunication from religion, from a religion, mm -hmm. I feel that uh, when religions excommunicate people, they are trying to control people. 
They are trying to control the belief systems of the individual. And so when a person has a differing belief system, instead of allowing that belief system to potentially challenge their own belief system, instead of openly and honorably with respect discussing the differences in beliefs, there is this uh, desire to just get rid of the person out of their life. And I feel that's a very damaging thing to do. It stops potential growth for both the person and the religion that they're in, and it stops the potential for change in a positive direction. You see, if, if everyone is at this level with regard to a particular religious belief system, and then one person is at this level, it would be better to discuss the matter rather than excommunicate mm -hmm. the person. And it's the same applies if everyone was at this level and one person was at this level. It would be better to discuss firstly with the person what's going on rather than just excommunicate them. And if the person is acting in a loving manner and respectful in their discussions with you, why would you ever remove them from any organisation that you are a part of? Unless they wanted to leave. If they want to leave, then let them go. Yeah. If, they, if they don't want to leave, then let them stay. Do you accept people who have different beliefs to you? And if a person has different beliefs to you, how do you treat them? Well, if I didn't accept people who had a different belief to me, then nobody would have ever come to any seminar. Mm -hmm. The reality is that every single person who comes to a seminar has a completely different belief system than I have. And after a while, that, that may change, you know, because they might be convinced through a heap of explanation and logical examination and also personal experience that what I'm showing them is true. And at the start, almost every single person I meet has a completely different belief system than I do. I love meeting people with different belief systems. Mm -hmm. So, I, yes, I certainly would not uh, treat badly or get rid of any person with a different belief system. I, in fact, I feel quite strongly that belief systems need to be discussed. And the only way you can discuss them is by having the person present. You can't discuss belief systems without pre pre person being present. The only time when I feel that it's wrong to discuss with anybody a particular belief system is when the person is ridiculing you, making fun of you, or generally being unkind and unloving towards you. Under those circumstances, then I feel it's necessary to cease the conversation. And if it's in one of my seminars, I'll ask the person to remove themselves because I'm providing the seat that they sit on and I'm providing the venue for them to sit in. And I'm also providing my time for free for them to listen if they wish to listen, but they don't have to. Mm -hmm. And if they wish to argue with me during a seminar, then I'll ask them to leave because that's not loving. I'm perfectly happy to answer questions. I'm not happy to engage with a person in an, in an argumentative debate or fight about issues when I can feel from the person that all they want to do is push their own perspective or point of view without respecting the fact that they're coming along to my venue. If, if it would be different if I was going along to their venue. If I was going along to their vision, venue, I would listen calmly and quietly and analyse with my own mind and with my own heart the material that was being presented, but I wouldn't attack them or anything because I'd recognise and respect the fact that they're providing the venue and the seat that I'm sitting on, which is a gift of love from them. Mm -hmm. So I just feel quite strongly that there is no need for any negative behaviour, uh, any attacking behaviour in a discussion of belief systems. Often, unfortunately, on this planet, often we get to the point where negative behaviour is very prevalent with the discussion of belief systems. And that is because people don't know how to deal with their emotions. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to deal with somebody disagreeing with them, for example. They don't know how to deal with somebody, who, you know, somebody who's feeling grief or feeling anger or feeling resentment. They don't know how to address all of those particular issues. And I feel that's one of the main problems that we face in religious discussion on the planet. If there was a more free and open religious discussion, there would be more religions on the planet which would have far more uh, collective ideals that they'd recognise their collective ideals. Many of them are actually um, agreeing with each other. They would be able to get along with each other better as a result of that. And they'd also be more loving towards each other, which is the main point of any development. The main point of any development is developing to become a better person yourself. And that includes spiritual development. If spiritual development is not helping you be a more loving person, then you need to give it up and find some other form of development. <laughs> 
Sure. Mm. Sure. Do you tell people they must buy anything in order to get closer to God or in order to personally improve their own life? Yeah, definitely not. Although buying something might help them. <laughs> How like, is that? Well, I've bought many books um, that, you know, I've, at libraries and whatever, I've hired out books, but I've also bought books that I thought helped me develop spiritually and emotionally into a more loving person. So there's some wonderful books that I've read that I've actually bought. Yeah. Um, but I don't believe that anybody needs to buy anything from myself mm -hmm. because everything that I do is for free. So nobody needs to buy a book or buy, you know, something or donate to us if they don't want to donate to us. Um, you know, the only time that we accept donations is when we feel it's given out of a grateful heart. And in fact, the only time we believe a donation should be given is when it's given with a grateful heart. Mm -hmm. And there are many times, as you know, where we've received a donation or a gift from somebody because we don't feel it comes from the right motivation. We've refused it, you mean? You said mm. we Sorry, it. refused yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, because we don't believe it comes from the right motivation. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So I feel like uh, there are many things on the planet that will help a person grow with regard to the love they have for themselves, the love they have for the others, and also in their relationship with God. And I believe that if, if there's anything worthy of spending your money on, that's the things you're worthy of spending your money on. You won't have to do it with divine truth, though, because everything we do is free. Sure. <laughs> and do you think it's the act of buying the thing that brings them closer to God? Not the act of buying, no. It's not like a person can buy themselves out of purgatory, as the Catholic Church would, would have a person believe, perhaps. Um, it's not a, there's no way of buying a character. You can't buy character. You have to develop it, you know. So it's impossible to spend money to buy something that's actually going to improve your development. You've got to engage a process, an emotional and intellectual process of development before you're going to improve in the way in which you relate to everyone around you, but also in your relationship with God. So I certainly don't believe a person needs to buy something in order to have some kind of development. One thing I do notice on this planet, though, a lot is unless a person buys something, they don't value it. Mm -hmm. And that is a problem because there are many things on this planet available for free that have far more worth than, than, a per, than what you could buy something. So, so my suggestion to a person is to not evaluate worth based on how much they've spent on it, but rather on how much it can change and affect their life. That's the, th that's the way to measure the worth of something. But certainly if I found that something was going to improve my relationship with God, I'd definitely buy it if mm -hmm. somebody was selling it. Um, in my case, though, if uh, I believe what I'm teaching does improve a person's life and improves their relationship with God, and I'm giving it away as well for free, no strings attached. Mm -hmm. Do you tell people they must accept you in order to get closer to God or in order to personally improve their own life? <laughs> yes, they definitely need to accept me in order to get closer to God and in order to personally improve their own life. And when I say that, what I'm saying is, they need to accept me just as they need to accept every other child of God on this planet. If you cannot accept another person who is God's child, how are you ever going to accept God? So the reality is, if you're going to develop in love and truth on this planet and you're going to improve personally with your own development, spiritually and emotionally, you need to accept every person around you. And that includes me, Jesus. You need to also accept me. I'm not unique in that way. I do not believe a person needs to accept me as Jesus in the sense that uh, they need to accept everything that I say without any question. However, one thing that will become apparent during their relationship with God is that everything that I've taught them with their relationship with God will turn out to be true. Now, they'll find that out sooner or later. And in that way, they'll come to accept the teachings that I teach. Mm -hmm. And this is what I meant, meant in the first century, like that I had the keys to the kingdom. And the keys to the kingdom that I referred to when I was talking with the so-called Apostle Peter in the first century was all about the key to this relationship with God, the key to this relationship with yourself, the key to your relationship with your soulmate. Th these keys are all a part of the teachings that I share with people. They are things that every single person eventually will accept if they ha want the kind of relationship with God that I'm describing. But they won't accept them because I'm Jesus. 
-hmm. They'll accept them because these are God's truths and God will eventually show them that they have to accept these truths in order to become at one with God. Mm. Yeah. And would you mind defining a little bit more what you mean then by accept? Um, when you say a person, if they want to grow towards God, they have to accept you as much as they've got to accept me, as much as they've got to accept somebody else. Mm -hmm. What does that practically or emotionally mean to accept a person? Well, to accept a person means to respect them, to, to care about their welfare, to care about like, you know, their, their, their life, their day-to-day -day life, it means to be able to listen to them when they, when they speak. It also means to not accept things that, like their rage and their anger and other emotions. And when I say not accept it, we don't have to be present with those particular emotions. When we accept ourselves as much as we accept another person, that means we love ourselves as much as we love the other person. It means that we would treat each other ethically. So I would not demand of you something that I would not ask of myself, for example. And I would not demand that you listen to my abuse when I would never listen to your abuse. Um, so so these are, these are, this is sort of the ethical treatment. When we accept a person, we treat them ethically, no matter what our religious background and what our, what our belief systems are. Mm -hmm. And so within that, you're saying that even though I can accept you and still be in a state of acceptance, even if I say, I don't want to have anything more to do with you because you're being quite abusive at this moment. Yeah. I'm st I can still be in a state of acceptance, and I guess that's what I was trying to understand from you. Exactly. So what what is the state inside my heart when I do that that still is accepting? Well, you, you, are, not, you are not judging the person for their behaviour. You're not condemning them because it's not even your right or ability to condemn. However, you're just saying to them, I can't engage with this with you. I have to remove myself because I accept myself as much as I accept you. And this is, we get, this is the principle of ethical behaviour with others. If we are truly ethical in the way in which we act with other people, we will not expect of them things that we would certainly not do ourselves or, and we certainly wouldn't uh, demand of them things that we wouldn't demand of ourselves. We would not try to manoeuvre them or push them into a certain direction that and, and in particular, we wouldn't try to do it if we wouldn't do it to us, if they wouldn't be able to do it to ourselves. So we need to consider these aspects when we're dealing with people. If we truly accept people, we will have a very much a live and let live type of attitude. We won't be attacking them all the time, condemning them for their choices or decisions. We will just speak the truth in each case that we're given the opportunity. And we won't do it with rage and anger behind it because there is no need for rage and anger behind something and obviously they're driven by other emotions that we need to address if we do have rage and anger so my feelings are when we accept a person that's when we really love them we really care about their welfare but we must also accept ourselves as much as we accept another person and that means that if the other person is harming us then we would not accept that behavior which is different than accepting the person when we have an attitude of judgment to people, what we're doing is we're projecting emotion at them. And basically, with an attitude of judgment, what we're doing is we're saying to the person that they are not as good as us, that they don't have as much worth as we do, that they are unworthy for our attention or, 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 or even our time. The reality is that every single person on this planet is worthy. Every single person on this planet is able to engage our time with one exception and the exception is if they treat us in an unloving manner if they treat us in a manner that demonstrates that they do not have the right concept of what love or ethical behavior is then of course that's the exception that's the time when we would no longer engage that particular person's time and company we will still love them and accept them as people but we wouldn't be able to accept their behaviour perpetrated towards ourselves, nor would we be able to accept that same behaviour perpetrated towards someone else. In other words, we can, we can actually say, no, your behaviour is wrong. I know it's wrong because it's unloving and it causes pain. And I don't want to share with you in the engagement of that behaviour. I don't want to enable you to engage that behaviour with myself or with other people. 
And as far as it depends on me, I don't want to share with you in this behavior, so I'm going to withdraw from you. You can withdraw from an individual and still love them and still care about their welfare and, in fact, still pray for them and still desire their happiness. Mm -hmm. When you don't care for a person, you start attacking their happiness. You start condemning their behavior. You start being in a rage with them. You will even have a tendency towards violence towards them or wanting them to be harmed. And this is all an indication of unethical and unloving behavior. There is no need to engage in that form of behaviour with any person, no matter what their belief systems. Yeah, I think the feeling for me is what about allowance. If I accept everyone, I can choose to not be in their company, but I'll still allow it. And that to me is a feeling of acceptance of... Um, you still allow what? I still allow them to be however they want to be and not try to control it. I will just go away. Yes, but if a person was in my location, then I could not allow it. Yeah, totally. The reality is that there yeah. are times when I could not allow yeah. a person's behaviour without strenuously um, sticking up for what I believe is the right the ethical behaviour. Yeah, so, I can't so, describe this feeling inside of me, yeah. Because when you say that, I agree with that. So it's, yeah. Well, there's, the feeling inside of you, I feel, is the feeling of guilt that you have when you ask somebody to leave your life who has treated you badly. And this causes you to have a, a, a feeling where, that you don't know whether you've done the right thing or not in terms of how, how you remove a person from your life. I definitely have that, that yeah. is for sure. But there's some pure feeling, I think, which means that I feel like, and I'm open to it being an error, that I feel like I can accept my family treating me. I, I, I can accept them as people but not accept their treatment. That's what I've been saying, yeah. isn't it? Like in the yeah. end, in the end, we, we can accept the person, but we do not have to accept their behaviour. And, and the person as an individual is different to their behaviour. Yeah. Their behaviour is a subset of lots of different problems and, and things that have gone on with them. For example, the behaviour of certain individuals is completely dependent upon the choices they've made in their life and also their history. So, you know, we and in accepting the person, we accept their choices and we accept their history, but we might not agree with their behaviour, particularly if their behaviour is, is damaging towards other people or ourselves. Mm -hmm. It's immaterial whether it's other people or ourselves, because if we're ethical, we will treat ourselves the same as we treat other people. So even if they damaged an average person on the street, then my, I would have a problem with their behaviour. So, for example... If somebody was walking down the street and they decided to yell a heap of abuse at somebody and the person who's yelling the abuse happens to be one of my friends, I would draw a line and say, look, mate, I, like I can't be your friend while you keep doing all of this. I can accept you as an individual, but this behaviour, mate, is way out of line. Mm -hmm. and, and whenever you engage in this behaviour, you're not being loving or caring for the other person. You're being an obnoxious person, actually, and I can't agree with that behaviour. And to be honest... I can't be with you if you're going to engage in this behavior all the time because all I'm doing is enabling your behavior. So my, the most loving thing I can do under those circumstances is say, I can't be with you while you're doing this behavior. The best thing for me to do is withdraw from you until you're willing to change this behavior. Then I'd love to be with you again. And that is acceptance without acceptance of the poor behavior. Mm -hmm. That's what love would do. Mm -hmm. Love has principles. You know, and this is the thing I feel that many people don't understand. Everyone, there's a big tendency in many people to believe that love just accepts everything. No, it doesn't. Love has principles. It, it, it accepts the individual, but it does not accept everything. It, ex it doesn't accept their behaviour if their behaviour is out of harmony with love. Yeah, yeah. As regards people accepting me personally, they don't need to, as I've already explained, accept me personally. However... They are going to need to accept the truths that I teach at some point in their lives. The reason why is because they're not my truths. If they want to have a relationship with God and they want to have a happy life and they want to be at one with their soulmate and with God, at some point in the future, they are going to have to accept all the things that I've taught them that I've said for certain are true. Now, I'm not saying that because I, they have to accept what I'm saying. I'm saying because I've had to accept them as well. And as I've already explained to many people, I, I, I didn't want to always accept them, but I had to come to accept them because 
they were God's truths and God would taught me that they were God's truths. So at some point in our future, we will need to come to accept everything that God teaches us as truth if we wish to have a relationship with God and if we wish to have uh, an, one type of relationship with, each, with our soulmate. This is an essential. We can't avoid it. However, I'm not saying that a person has to do that. I'm just saying if they want a relationship with God and if they want a, you know, at one minute relationship with God and their soulmate, they are going to have to accept these teachings at some point in the future. I'm not saying they have a time limit on that. I'm not saying they're going to be punished if they don't. And I'm not saying that uh, anything else will occur as a result. I'm just saying they will have to accept these teachings if they want to become at one with God at some point in the future. So just to clarify that a little bit, mm -hmm. are you saying that people I thought who... it was pretty clear already, but go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose further to that. Yeah. Further to that. Are you saying that if people do not know any divine truth, then they do not have a relationship with God? No, I'm saying that many times people have uh, parts of the truth in their soul already. So there are people who do not know formally the divine truth. And knowing the divine truth is not about knowing the divine truth intellectually. Knowing the divine truth is about knowing the divine truth in your soul. Now, there are many people who have never heard the divine truth who know some divine truth in their soul, right? So it's not about a formal acceptance or some kind of process or that you go through with God. It's about the emotional process you engage with God. Now, if a person does not have a relationship with God, then they will not know much divine truth. They might know some, but they won't know much. If a person develops their relationship with God and receives divine love through that process, they'll know a lot more and eventually they'll know lots and lots and lots and they'll know that there's even more to discover and they'll keep discovering more and more and more as their life goes on. They'll realize, in fact, that it's an infinite process. That's what will happen as they get, get to know the truth. So a person who's never heard the truth may already have some divine truth in their soul because they've entered this kind of relationship with God, relationship with things around them. But without accepting these truths in the future, they will, their relationship will stagnate at some point. And there are many people on this planet whose relationship with God has stagnated as a result of their refusal to accept a part of divine truth that, that I've been teaching with them for thousands of years. Now, I'm not saying that I'm anything special in all of that. I'm just saying that God has taught me these things. I have had to come to the same recollection myself. I have had to accept these truths even when I haven't wanted to. I've had to come to accept them at some point if I wanted to grow my own relationship with God. And I desperately and desire, desire my relationship with God. And as a result of that, I've been willing to change my own personal perspective and willing to change my own personal belief systems and my own behavior and attitude in order to get closer to God. And every single person who wants to be close to God will need to go through this exactly the same process. Do you tithe or ask people to donate a portion of their wages to you? Well, tithing is like a taking a tenth of somebody's wages. Now, I don't have control over a person's wages and I never wish to have control over anybody's wages. So I would never suggest to a person that they give me a tenth of their wages or give me any of their wages, in fact. What I do believe, though, is that anybody who donates to our effort needs to consider whether they have gratitude for the effort and whether they would like the effort to continue. Because obviously, if we do receive no donations, then we cannot continue our effort in our current form and we'd have to change and do something else. Also, if a person doesn't have gratitude for what we do, then why would they give us anything in order to keep doing it? It's far better than for them to spend their money on something they have gratitude for, maybe a cup of coffee or something that they actually enjoy. <laughs> My suggestion to people is that donate to us if they have gratitude for what they receive, if, if it's benefited their life, and if they want our effort to continue. If we find that we do not receive enough donations with people from, from that, those methods, then what we will do is we'll go away and do some work of our own to earn money in another way and uh, to survive in some other way. We cannot agree with tithing because tithing forces a person to give a certain amount every single week or month without there being much thought about the gratitude or feeling about the gratitude that's involved in the process. 
it's almost like a law is being made and it's a man-made law and as you know i feel about all man-made laws that if they contradict any of god's laws then really they need to be discarded Mm. would you say divine truth is a new religion and are you leading a new religion well divine truth is not my truth and because it's not my truth and in fact i believe it's god's truth then it's been around infinitely it's been around ever since god's been around and i believe that god is infinite so therefore i believe the divine truth itself has been around for the same infinite amount of time in addition because god is infinite in nature that's what i currently believe i also believe then that the truths i can discover are infinite in nature so nobody could ever write a book about it one day and be right the next day because at the end, end of the time period there's going to need to be an adjustment as a person discovers more truth so firstly i do not believe god divine truth is new it is something that god has had forever and i don't know how long or whether god my feeling is god has had an infinite existence so i believe divine truth has also existed infinitely in time and in space so therefore i feel quite strongly that divine truth is something that is not new but very very old (laughs) but in addition to that um i'm not starting a new movement divine truth has been around as i said forever and all i've done is discovered some more of it that people hadn't discovered until i came along and I'm continuing to discover more of it as time goes on in my development with my relationship with God and my development of accepting the truth that God's already shown me. As a result of that, I get to find out more truth. And this process will continue forever, my, those my feelings. It will continue forever. I will continue discovering more truth, more truth, more truth. Other people may, in fact, discover the truth before I do. And if that's the case, I will have to accept the truth that I've discovered, and I need to, do, to accept that if I want to continually grow my relationship with God. This is not a religious movement, because all religious movements, as I've described in other questions, all religious movements begin with mankind's ideas about God. This has not begun with mankind's idea about God. It's about God's transmission of God's ideas about God to man, which mm-hmm. is a very, very different focus. Mm-hmm. God has shown me through this communication, through this way that, that God showed me I needed to follow to discover God. God has shown me more and more truth about God and the universe and everything else. And, and God can do that with every single individual who has ever lived and who will ever live, who will ever live in the future. So, so what we need to understand is divine truth is not a religion. It is not a movement. It is, in fact, the truth of the universe. And all I am doing is sharing it with anybody who will listen. That's all I am doing. And I'm sharing only the portions I've discovered. And there are many other portions I am sure I'm yet to discover. And so therefore, anything I currently share will need to be modified at some point in the future to accommodate the new truth. Hmm. One thing that we need to understand is that we do not have a choice about how we worship God. God chooses how we worship God. Mankind thinks that they have a choice about how to worship God and God will accept all forms of worship. That is not true. And in fact, it's quite arrogant to assume that. It's almost like saying, I can force you into having a relationship with me on my terms. And that's not the case. We cannot force God into having a relationship with us on our terms. God has already created the terms through which we are going to have a relationship with him The only choice that we have is whether we're going to accept those terms or not. The only choice we have is, are we going to have a relationship with God on his terms or not? That's the only choice that faces us. That is a part of the divine truth. Mm. 